So a bit of a hands up, who is familiar with the Lambda or Kappa architectures? OK, so all oh, three of you. So you three people might be a bit bored in the first couple of slides then, because we talk about those. <laughs> but uh, for the rest of you, we'll get a bit more detail. So obviously, a lot of industries today have a need to view and process large amounts of data. Whether you're a website, when you're looking at clicks on ads, you're looking at clicks on your website, you're looking at sales, or like where I work in an investment bank, obviously we have lots of trades streaming in. So how do we process those and how do we visualize those? Um, obviously we previously had things like Hadoop, which I'm not knocking Hadoop at all, but <laughs> it allows you to process very large data sets. Um, and I mean, one of the systems that I work on, we've got a nine petabyte Hadoop cluster. So we've got to know lots of data. Um, but the reality is, it's not particularly fast. And so if you need real time information, Hadoop is on its own is not your solution. Or HDFS certainly is not your solution. Um, and there's also been stream processing around. I mean, if you're as old as me, you'll remember that there were, you know, CEP engines were a big thing back in the round. Well, I can't remember what it was now, 2000, maybe a bit later than that, 2006, <laughs> seven. Um, but the reality is they never really took off at the time. Um, but they have existed for a while, and obviously there are things like uh, now Flink or Storm, or uh, we're going to see a bit today on the Hazelgast Jet. So stream processors, but what they're good at is processing small amounts of data very, very fast. They're not so good if you try and dump a you know, sort of 100 gigabyte file at them. So what can we do to really combine those? And there's been a quite a lot of architecture suggested recently. So we've already discussed um, or mentioned uh, the Lambda architecture and the Kappa architecture. I mean, some vendors are bringing out products. Um, I don't know if uh, many of you are familiar with um, no, so Acker, um, but that's created by a company called Lightbend, who have got what they call a big and fast data platform. Um, so that's trying to achieve kind of the same thing as well. Obviously, they sell it to you know, pre-integrated, although it's built up of open source technologies. So the Lambda architecture. I mean, it's uh, Nathan Mars, who's the guy who came up with the Apache Storm. So it's a stream processor. He basically wrote a book called Big Data. Um, and in that book, he proposed an architecture, which he called the Lambda architecture, which effectively has two different layers, uh, a speed layer, which is for real-time views, and then it has a batch layer, which he used uh, HDFS for. And because it's a reasonably old book, he was using um, just straight uh, Hadoop HD, uh, MapReduce rather than Spark or anything. Um, and so basically, he had batches to pull that together. We'll talk about a bit about that later on. But the idea is we can look at things in a fast way or we can look at things in a you know, new data or old data. Old data is probably more truthful because it's been processed and verified, whereas our real-time view is just stuff that's been banging in. So that's kind of the idea behind the Lambda architecture. Uh, the Kappa architecture was created by a guy whose name escapes me, but um, I think he worked at LinkedIn. And he, the paper that he wrote, which described the Kappa architecture, was called Turning the Database Inside Out. And the reason for that, I don't know if you people are familiar with the fact that um, Apache Kafka was actually created by LinkedIn. And his idea was, oh, we don't need a database at all because we've got Kafka's logs. So obviously, that's an interesting solution. And we'll talk a bit about that as well. But the advantage of the Kappa architecture is it's a purely streaming architecture. Um, so it streams again into real-time views, but uh, potentially because of a stream processor, allows you to process stuff in real time. It has a bit of a handicap on how it's storing historical data. So what does the Lambda architecture look like on a super simplified schematic? Uh, so basically, we've got a bunch of systems generating events, messages, whatever you want to call them. 
put those onto Kafka topics. I mean, it doesn't have to be Kafka. It could be any kind of messaging solution. Um, <clears throat> but we route those into a speed layer. So what I've suggested here, we can use in-memory caches for that. I mean, it could be a stream processor. In fact, in the original book, he suggests Apache Storm for this layer. But I mean, it's effectively, it just needs to be something fast. Uh, and then we serve that out to our users to view and query that data. But in the Lambda architecture, we also feed into HDFS. Um, and then we use batch processes to effectively create batch views, which are our real source of truth. So really, in the Lambda architecture, we've got a real-time view, which we kind of believe, but we're prepared to sacrifice truth for speed. Um, and then we have a actual version of the truth, which we are prepared to wait for because we know it'll be true. So obviously, if I'm a developer writing some microservices here, because I want to visualize and serve that up to a you know, visualization layer, and then it means to come up with any particular view, I need to do a combination of speed information and obviously the slower stuff in HDFS. So it's, you know, it's a workable solution, definitely. But it doesn't come without its disadvantages and the layers of complexity. And if you read the book, uh, like I said, Nathan Marr's Big Data, he goes into an incredible amount of detail on data storage and HDFS, data formats, best way to write files, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of uh, complexity that can come from just trying to write this kind of system. So you know, the benefits of and challenges. So obviously, we get a real-time view. That's great news, because we want to analyze real-time data, our users demanding data really fast. Uh, we can support historical data queries. So we've got a huge, great Hadoop cluster. OK, we can run a massive uh, Spark job, or whatever it is, a MapReduce job, to query that data. Oops, sorry, I pressed the button by accident there. Uh, going the wrong way. Um, both layers are horizontally scalable. So obviously, we can scale Hadoop by adding more nodes to the cluster. If we're using Hazelcast, or we're using Storm, or we're using some other stream processor as a speed layer, and then we can scale those horizontally as well. So we've got a horizontally scalable architecture as our business develops. Now, we start off with our solution. Nope, no one really believes us, so we build it small. Uh, but as it becomes more successful, suddenly now everyone wants to join in, start shunting loads of data at us. OK, we've got the, the ability to horizontally scale without re-engineering. Um, yeah, and obviously Hadoop itself has a lot of useful tools. So things like Spark, you know, Hive, uh, if you're using Cloudera or Impala, um, those are all useful tools for doing big data analytics. So you've got access to those for your big data layer. So that's handy. Uh, fault tolerant, um, obviously that's kind of questionable. <laughs> uh, Hadoop is, because it is clustered and replicated, distributed and replicated, I should say. And then obviously you'd have to have a fairly substantial failure for you to lose any data. I mean, one of the problems with Hadoop, of course, is not very easy to back up. And um, obviously if you've got very large Hadoop clusters, then I mean, where do you back it up to? I guess it's a question but. Uh, um, I mean, there's nothing to stop you just reading all the files onto a tape and then, OK, I'm fine and dandy. But there's not in the same way that a traditional relational database would have, you know, Oracle or something like that, for writing stuff onto tape and backing up. So what are the challenges? Yeah, so obviously we've got a synchronization problem between the speed and the batch layers. So I can't guarantee that what I'm seeing in my speed layer will even appear in my batch layer because I'm doing a normalization and a creating a version of the truth in my batch layer. Um, obviously, this system is purely for analytics. It's not a transactional system. We're not running any transaction, business transactions there. I don't mean transactions as in a you know, JTA kind of transaction. I mean as in a business transaction. All I'm doing is pouring data into a system and then trying to view it and analyze it. Um, we've already, I've already mentioned that the fact, obviously, we've got two subsystems. So if we're going to try to create a single view for the users, our well, microservices have got to look at two 
sets of data. Um, and I already mentioned about the you know, heavy focus on HDFS. And the reality is, with a Hadoop cluster, I mean, if you're lucky enough to have your own, maybe you can guarantee that what time your stuff's going to run. Um, in situations that I've worked in, and maybe many others, you're in a shared cluster. And so you've got no guarantee that your job's going to run in a certain time because someone else could be running a massive job at the same time. I mean, obviously, in, you, know, you can allocate cores and things like that, but uh, it doesn't always work out as you hope. So someone came up with the Kappa architecture. And in the Kappa architecture, what we're suggesting again, we've got our source of events or messages. Uh, we're pushing those into Kafka, but what we're interested in here is the fact that Kafka's running an immutable log. So uh, I don't know how familiar people are with Kafka, but effectively it's a distributed log system that has the appearance of a topic. So what it's doing underneath is basically writing all that data down, and it's there as long as you want to keep it, and we then stream that through our stream computation layer. So obviously there are many products available today, whether that's, I mean, if people are using Amazon, they might know Amazon Kinesis is the kind of thing they're using here. I mean, Apache Flink, Apache Storm, Gear Pump, I mean, there's a, a whole bunch of tools which do this kind of stream computation. Um, but we need to process this. So what we're saying is, rather than having the batch layer we had in the Lambda architecture, we are doing all our processing in this streaming layer. So we're, we're processing the data as soon as it arrives. So the idea is there that that gives us a much lower latency to the truth. Whereas before we had to, we had a version of the truth, but it wasn't particularly reliable, it was fast. And we had a slow but version of guaranteed truth. What we're trying to suggest here is we can have a guaranteed version of the truth, but we can receive it quickly. We still need a serving layer, so we need a fast caching layer or very fast database to receive all that streaming data. And again, we serve it out through microservices onto our visualization layer. Obviously, what you can see is it's a much simpler architecture because I've only got one system. Um, but there are complications. So, okay, say my in-memory caches fall over. How do I restart them? Well, according to the Lambda architecture, uh, sorry, Kappa architecture, well, I just read them straight back from the um, Kafka logs. But it depends how much data I'm interested in reading back. I mean, how much data can I really store in Kafka logs? If you think I've got, you know, in my Kafka cluster, I've got a replication factor of five, um, I'm receiving a terabyte a day of data. So that means my Kafka logs are going to be five terabytes. So ultimately, someone's going to be moaning at you for the size of your logs. <laughs> uh, on top of that, uh, unless you are keeping an offset count in your receiving application, so in my serving layer, I can't say to Kafka, can you give me a specific record? What I can say to Kafka is, can you replay me everything? So obviously, I can replay everything back through the streaming layer. It's very fast, so maybe that's not a problem. I can replay it overnight. OK, I'm back where I was, or recover from a failure. But ultimately, um, for my serving layer to ask for a replay, OK, it's potentially difficult. Any questions on that? So what are the benefits and challenges of Kappa? So we've got a real-time view of the latest data, and we know that's the version of the truth. Um, it's a single serving layer. So we haven't got what we had with the Lambda architecture. We've got two systems trying to serve as data. We've got one, so that makes it easy. Uh, again, we are horizontally scalable at every layer. So you know, once we become hyper-successful, no worries. We can scale to whatever you require. Just give us more hardware. That's always a nice thing to say. Um, no, fault tolerant. OK, well, because we've got Kafka as our topic, and it has got this immutable log of our data, assuming that doesn't get corrupted, uh, then we are in a good position because we can always replay from a certain point, or replay everything. 
So that means if our system goes down, we can always rerun. Um, OK, if we've got a particularly <laughs> big logs, we can support <laughs> historical queries. I mean, <coughs> obviously, there's a kind of <laughs> a realistic limit on how much historical data you're really going to keep in your Kafka logs. Um, but the reality is we can keep a lot because our streaming layer, stream computation layer, is so fast that we can process an enormous amount of data very quickly. Um, yeah, so it's got fewer moving parts. So you know, if you're building any system, you know, the, uh, keeping it as simple as possible is always an advantage. And obviously, from a programming point of view, I'm only concentrating on stream processing, really. So I don't know how familiar people are with stream processing systems like Flink or Spark Streaming, but really they're working on a, effectively an in-memory version of MapReduce. So if you're doing maps or flat maps against a stream and then you're doing reduces, no, no, no reduces, uh, the same, effectively the same programming model that you actually use on Hadoop, but you can apply it to streams as well. Obviously the challenges we've got are, yeah, how can we replay enormous amounts of data back on demand? That's not straightforward. To manage that, query capability on a Kafka log is a non-trivial kind of a activity. Um, yeah, obviously, if you've got lots of historical queries, and then we have to wait for the data to be rerun, so it has to run through the stream processor again. OK, it might be fast, but it's not instantaneous. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know about you, but if I said to my boss, OK, we're not going to have any database at all apart from the Kafka log, I think I might be fired. So it's a, <laughs> a potentially difficult situation to sell to your management. Um, although maybe if this is just an analytic system, OK, if it takes us a day to rebuild it, doesn't make any difference. Uh, yeah, Kafka log sizes we've discussed. Um, but even if we've got giant Kafka logs, unless we're shipping them into Hadoop, we, uh, we don't have the tools that are available in Hadoop for doing those large-scale analytics across the big data set. So the Kappa architecture is great for real-time information and getting a real-time version of the truth. The disadvantage is I can't use big data analytics tools on my data set. I mean, that may or may not be a disadvantage for you. So, how can Hazelcast help us? I should say that I don't, not, they don't work for Hazelcast. Uh, they did give me some stickers, but that's the limit of their generosity. Um, but are people familiar with Hazelcast at all? OK, not many. <laughs> so Hazelcast is an in-memory data grid. It's effectively a distributed map. So like a map, it's got a key value pair store. Um, but that can be distributed across many, many nodes. And so you can run very large in-memory Hazelcast clusters to store large volumes of data. Um, I mean, I've seen Hazelcast clusters that are multi-terabyte. Um, obviously, you know, that takes quite a lot of hardware because it's running in a JVM, it's a Java product. Um, but it does allow off-heap storage and all kinds of clever things to try and minimize that kind of hassle. Um, well, Hazelcast also have a product called Jet. So Jet is a stream processor, uh, which, like the other ones I've talked about, so Gear Pump or Flink or Spark Streaming, can do real-time aggregation and processing. So if we were interested in having Hazelcast as our serving layer, it might make sense to have Jet as our stream computation layer as well. Because then we've got one product which works nicely together which really runs the core of our system. So absolutely, it's we can use Injet. So I mean, DAG's directed acyclic graph, which is just a fancy way of saying, I'm going to set up a series of, act, of processes and chain them together. Um, but we can do maps and flat maps. We can group and accumulate exactly as we'd like to do on a normal stream processor. Um, and if we need to, 
I mean, if you just take an example, like where I work in a bank, we get trades coming in. Uh, when those trades come in, I actually need to, before I can process them, I need to actually look up a whole bunch of data on uh, reference data, things like who the actual party that the tra who took part in the trade was, what instrument they did, because all this stuff on the trade message is implemented in codes. So maybe if you're working in an e-commerce system, you know, when you get a message from your uh, the purchase, um, when that comes in, it doesn't have all the particularly relevant data you've got. Things are mapped to keys or codes, and I have to look all that stuff up. And so using Hazelcast to hold your reference data as well means your stream process has got very fast access to that reference data. I mean, uh, one of the well, regularly used patterns for storing large volumes of data in, uh, in memory data grids like Hazelcast is to use a, effectively a star schema inside your grid. And so if you imagine in the you know, where I work in a bank, we've got trades coming in. Trades are effectively facts because they've got lots of numbers on. Um, but we've got lots of dimensions as well. So things like parties, instruments, uh, accounting books, all kinds of stuff, which I don't, that's not really carried on my trade message. I need to look all that stuff up as I'm processing. And so having my stream processing layer, having access to a fast in-memory data grid allows that processing to occur very, very fast. And because I'm holding effectively a star schema inside my in-memory data grid and my trades are facts, I need to strip out all useless information, non-fact information from my trade, and substitute it with keys, which are going to be the keys which I can use to look up in my dimensions. And once I've done that, my data is available for viewing into the users. Hazelcast itself has, can read and write from arbitrary database. So it has a method called MapStore, oh, sorry, an interface called MapStore, which you implement yourself. And from that, you can talk to SQL databases, you could talk to Kafka, you could talk to anything you like to pull data back. So if I need to reload Hazelcast, I can pull that back through triggering um, a Kafka replay push that again through JET, and pull that back into Hazelcast. So that allows me, for my users, to say, OK, I need some historical data. Uh, because the way Hazelcast works, and this is true of coherence as well, or um, InfiniSpan, or other um, in-memory data grids, um, once you make the query here, if the, query, the data is not available in the grid, it can go back to its data source and read it back. So that could be an automated process. I mean, I'm not saying that's trivial if you're reading back from Kafka, but it's possible. So what we're trying to build here is a very fast, because all these stages are in memory, and Kafka's very fast. So basically, as fast as my data can be generated, I can push that, process it, store it, and serve it. One of the nice things about in-memory data grids as well is they have an event model. So every time data changes inside of my data grid, it generates an event. So my microservices here can listen to those events. In Hazelcast, there's a <coughs> an interface called a map listener. Um, so that map listener, or maybe it's a um, or maybe it's a class. I can't remember if it's a class or an interface. Um, but that map listener says, OK, I'm interested in events on this particular map. So every time the data in that map changes, it generates an event which tells me what's changed. I can use that to trigger processing actions in my microservices if I need to. Whether that's the case if I just want to stream those events up to my UI using WebSockets or similar. So basically, every time I get a new trade or a new sale or a new click, um, I can push that information from my in-memory layer through my microservice onto the UI. So in-memory data grids are very, very handy in this kind of architecture. Um, oh yeah, what I was saying here was uh, practically the same thing. Obviously, in, uh, when I was 
younger, we just used to call it event-driven, but now it's called reactive, apparently. So this is obviously a reactive microservice architecture we've got on top of it. So we're killing the buzzwords just by implementing this architecture. OK, so how can we go one better? One, I can come up with an even more RC name than Kappa and Lambda. So <laughs> obviously, uh, we can call it Mu. But as we've said, we've got a need to process and view large amounts of data. Kappa and Lambda architectures can do it, but they're really only analytical systems. So you know, traditionally, we'd have two effectively applications or two subsystems, one for online transactions and one for analytics or OLAP. So traditionally, that might be my data warehouse for my OLAP stuff, and I've got my transaction OLTP system doing my actual business stuff. But we can combine those into a single platform by really building on the Kappa and Lambda architectures. So the idea of having two separate things, why, well, we've already asked the question, why is my online processing, why is that different to my uh, historical query and analytics? Why do I need two systems? How can I have the same one? So what we can do is combine the two. Um, the advantage is we can have very fast transaction processing, and we can have very fast analytics, or even slower big data analytics. We can build a real-time reactive microservices platform. So for many industries or many of the projects I work on, and probably you guys as well, streaming the data in is one part of it. After that, something actually needs to happen to that data. There's a business process which needs to be executed. And having that Hazelcast layer or coherence layer or in-memory data grid is what's really going to allow those events to drive my microservices to process data. Obviously, we want something which is massively horizontally scalable. I mean, cloud-ready is kind of, I suppose, <laughs> arguable. It's whether you think Hadoop runs well on the cloud or not. Uh, but obviously, it does run on cloud, but uh, whether you think that's ideal. But really, by combining effectively a big data system with an in-memory data grid, we can give ourselves both OLTP and OLAP in the same solution. So what does that look like? Well, of course, it looks pretty similar to everything we've just seen. <laughs> um, but again, we've got systems generating our events. Our events are going onto Kafka. I mean, obviously, we've got one queue here or topic, but in reality, that would be many. <laughs> We've got our stream computation layer. And the good thing about having a stream processor here is obviously we can do our real-time processing. So real-time aggregation, real-time processing. It's talking to our in-memory serving layer, as we talked about before. Um, but it can also access our big data layer as well. I mean, many of the stream processing systems today, obviously things like Spark, who's got Spark streaming, and obviously Spark, no, traditional Spark, whatever that's called. Um, you know, Apache Flink has a streaming API and a batch API. So we can use our stream processor not just for real-time processing. We can also use it for big batches as well, depending on what we want to do. Um, of course, when we write into our serving layer, one of the things where I work is if we lose business information and then we get in trouble. Transactions are valuable. When I say transactions, I mean business transactions are valuable. And so obviously we don't want to lose them. So one of the nice things is with our serving layer, we can write that onto effectively a real-time big database store. So this isn't going to be HDFS. What it can be though is Cassandra or HBase or any of the other sort of high performance uh, big data systems. Um, because we've talked about in our serving layer and our in-memory data grid, we've just got an interface we need to implement for writing through. So what, what they call write behind, so an asynchronous write of data from here to here. I can do that straight onto HBase or to Cassandra. 
In fact, I could even, rather than doing right behind, which I would do for performance reasons, because my database is going to be much slower than my cache, maybe my database, because it's Cassandra running on you know, Fusion I.O. cards inside my mega-fast servers, um, is blazingly fast as well, um, I can just do right straight through. So effectively, I am persisting stuff as soon as it's written to my cache. So then you might say, OK, well, why do I need a caching layer? Why don't I just have my fast database? But what this gives us is the, effectively the generation of the events as the data comes in. So I can get my data. I can perform processing before I load it into my serving layer. My serving layer persists it for me. But it also generates events, which my microservices then use to trigger business processes. Those business processes might involve writing data back into the serving layer. But that's generating more events for me. And that can trigger more microservices. So the idea being we have an entirely reactive platform here. Our microservices never call each other directly. They only listen to each other's events. Obviously, they don't know the events. Who's generated the event? All they're doing is listening to events on the cache. So that means, one, it's very, very fast as far as the event generation goes. We can have, I mean, the, you can have huge amounts of map listeners living on, listing on each map um, without affecting the performance. So those events are generated up. We can write all the data back in. Our data's persisted as we write it. And we can look things up if we need to do lookups on any data for our microservices as we're doing our processing. Again, we've got very, very fast access. I mean, to give you an idea, um, probably querying Hazelcast over a, as a client over a network, you might be looking at, um, well, depending on how fast your network is, of course. I mean, maybe that's 10 to 100 milliseconds. So, okay, not lightning fast. But what I can also do is run a near cache. Well, so that's, that's effectively, I can keep a copy of this data or a subset of that data in here which is synchronized with my underlying cache. And that means that my microservice has virtually instantaneous access. I mean, down to microsecond level access to data that runs inside these microservices. So that means my microservice is not only reactive, they are lightning fast when they're doing lookups. Um, and obviously for my users, you know, we might have a combination of analytical work. So people are viewing and processing data He uh, can go to the big three tools. Is that me or? They can use the big data tools. So this could be Spark. It could be uh, some other kind of big data processing solution on top of uh, HBase or Cassandra. Uh, but I can also. Process thing very, very fast. My microservices, my business processes are running fast. So I think what we're trying to say here is we can combine transaction processing with big data processing. We can have a single solution with a relatively simple architecture to give us the best of both worlds. I mean, are these things, now are there, Many edge cases which will cause you problems. Of course, there are, but none of them are unsavable. So, because I'm an architect and most of my life is just writing Word documents and PowerPoint, I've also <laughs> created a project on GitHub, uh, which me and my mate have created, <laughs> um, doing an example. So. Uh, we've got something generated in trades. It's not actually JMeter now. We've got some microservices which generate this information. Uh, this is all running on DigitalOcean. So we've got on Docker containers. Um, we've got our Kafka topics. So we've got one writing trades, one uh, with prices being written to it. We're pushing that into Hazelcast Jet. Hazelcast Jet is writing to processing the information. So effectively what we're doing is, as I talked about with the a dimensional model is taking those trades, stripping out um, non-fact-based information, and substituting it with the keys of the dimensions I need to look up in my Hazelcast cluster. Um, and Hazelcast itself is writing that information to HBase. 
we have, well, I should say it's still a work in progress. So <laughs> we haven't got quite this many microservices going yet, but it's, uh, it is building up. So I think we do have uh, trade and party queries going at the moment. So we do have stuff streaming in. We're writing to HBase and coming to stream as well. And we have got a UI. Um, like I said, this uh, all the codes available on GitHub. So if you're interested in having a look or forking it or even joining in and making it better, and then you're very welcome. Um, obviously, I only ask that, remember, my mate and I are architects, and so don't laugh at our code too hard. I don't want any sarky comments. <laughs> Helpful comments only, please. <laughs> OK. So many industries need to view big and fast data. We used to have the tools for doing one or the other. We could use Hadoop for doing large data sets. But it was slow. We had stream processes for lots of small bits of data, uh, but it was fast. Now, the Lambda and the Kappa architectures have shown us that we can process big and fast data, uh, but they were really designed for analytics only. So they're not really designed for doing any transaction processing. So depending on your use case, I mean, maybe that's fine. Maybe. But uh, using the kind of in-memory data grids like Hazelcast or others, and stream processes like Jet or Flink, um, combined with big data technologies, allows us to effectively pros, uh, process yeah, unbounded data as fast as it can be streamed in. 